Woohoo! We are live. Aviola Abrams here, and I am here with you in Spiritpreneur School. Today we have a guest that I am so excited about. Well, I'm actually excited about all of our guests because that's the great thing about having your own series. You get to pick and choose amazing women to speak with. But this woman, Ms. Rachel Kramer Bussell, I have known for a really long time, and this is this conversation will allow me to get to know her a little better, as you do. And she has been an inspiration to me in many different ways. That back in the 2008 or 2009, when my first book, Dare, was published by Simon and Schuster, and then. I learned <laughs> on the fly like oh wait having a big time publishing deal doesn't mean anyone's gonna publicize your book it's up to you that Rachel appeared and invited me to come and do a reading in her in the flesh series in Manhattan and then inspired by her I created my own year-long series called Abiola's Kiss and Tell Live that was a reading series at Madame X in Manhattan and she's just amazing I'm gonna give you her formal bio in a little bit but let's say hi to her hey Rachel Hi. I love hearing about in the flesh, you know, flashbacks. Yes. It well, was a while ago now, so I don't think about it all the time, but I love doing that. It was amazing and I feel like you really you're you're an icon just in so many ways as a writer, as a woman who has created her own path and created her own way. And someone, you know, sent me a, a kind of a lot of people are very excited about this conversation, first of all. But I did receive like one kind of naysayer person, like sort of like um, new member, newer member to my tribe, who was like, you know, well, I, I'm not going to, you know, she's an erotica writer, and you know, this is spiritpreneur school, and somehow, you know, for her, the two didn't mix. But to me like that this is so appropriate and so right on and you're a woman who's created her own pathway in the world what could be more living in the spirit inspiration than that well thank you what what's funny is that I mean I'm really more of a workaholic than anything else I have to train myself to not be working at like nine o'clock at night when I should be relaxing with my boyfriend so yeah I mean, yes I mean I like I love what I do but you know I think that's one of the challenges of working for yourself that and it's it's like any other business just because I write erotica doesn't mean you know I don't work at it right and I say that to people all the time when they say, oh, how great to work from home. I say, well, the unfortunate thing is that there's no, you know, cutoff time and you could literally, and there's no end to your to-do list. You could literally be working 24 hours a day, you know, and not having a life. So wait, Rachel, I want to tell them all about you, the formal stuff. Rachel, Rachel Kramer Bussell is a New Jersey-based author, editor, writing instructor, and event organizer. She is the author of Sex and Cupcakes, a juicy collection of essays, sex columnist for Philadelphia City Paper and Dame, and editor of over 50 erotica anthologies, 50. Here's one that is on my Kindle right now, Dirty Girls. <laughs> I love that it's on your phone and your Kindle. It is. It is. And she writes widely about sex, dating, books, pop culture, hoarding, and whatever strikes her fancy. <laughs> now, Rachel, I'm going to start with a kind of, um, I guess, plebeian question. Um, I wrote when I, when I broadcast about this event, I said, let's find out all 50 shades of Rachel's spicy work. <laughs> and how she does it and whether she hates that Fifty Shades reference. Do you? <laughs> I don't. Um, I mean, I think what Fifty Shades has done for our culture is amazing. You know, it brought sexuality and fantasy and reading for pleasure and erotic pleasure into countless women's lives, women especially, I mean, men too, I think. So I would never say, oh, that's a bad thing, you know? And I think that people almost want you to hate Fifty Shades if you also write erotica. Like, they want you to say, oh, well, yours is better. And you know what? I, I think better is subjective, you know? Like, I think there's plenty to critique about it, but I think what it's done for discussions about sex is really unprecedented. I mean, maybe Sex and the City did something similar, but I, I think that it broke open discussions, not just about BDSM, but about like women demanding or asking or even thinking about 
pleasure. And I think it's also brought lots of opportunities for new writers. I've met tons of erotica writers who read Fifty Shades and either said, you know, I could do this or I could do it better or she would she wasn't a writer forever. She was a TV executive and she just wrote this on the side so I can do that too. And I definitely encourage people if they are interested to pick up a pen or grab their laptop and start writing. So I think the inspiration of E.L. James and how she came from fan fiction into bestsellerdom, like, I think that's all positive. So if people want to say what you do is like Fifty Shades, I say, great. I, I think that that's so awesome, and it's very refreshing to hear you say that, and I'm glad to hear you say that because I have to confess that, you know, first of all, wait, I, well, two confessions. I'm a big Fifty Shades fan on the opening day with um, someone to see it. But the, that wasn't the confession I was going to come out with. <laughs> the, other <confession, laughs> the other confession is that when I started as a writer that I was one of those very snobby writers. And, you know, I'm the daughter of a writer and, you know, so I had this kind of elitism about writing and I'm but I'm I'm glad that I have let that go you know in the past 10 years and I'm excited about this time period we're living in with this democratization of writing and people learning how to love the written word and express themselves in the written word whatever that means for them from hip hop writers to EL James to whatever That's exactly how I feel I mean there's always going to be someone you can quote unquote look down on their writing but what are you really saying that you're what you read is you know, more highbrow or smarter or whatever. I mean, I just think I want people to read, you know? I don't really right. care. I mean, yeah, do I want them to read my book? Sure. But, like, just as a general principle, I want people to read because plenty of people don't probably don't read even one book in a year. So right. if people are reading, like, good for them. And, and I also think, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, this book is portraying, you know, BDSM negatively. Okay, but you also have to give readers credit for being able to think for themselves and make their own decisions and opinions. Like maybe they're reading it and liking some parts and hating other parts. That's part of the reading experience too. And what the great thing about, you know, modern times now, you can go on Goodreads, you can go on, you know, chat rooms. You can you can talk about what you're reading and find other people who might have uh, recommendations of similar books. Like there's review sites that only review menage, meaning threesome, romances. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> to me that fact that there's such niche groups is amazing. I like, love that. You didn't, have, awesome. you didn't have that. I started writing erotica in 2000 and I mean yes there was there were online communities but it, I don't think readers had as many places to go and find other readers to connect with. So I think that's all a wonderful thing. And I think publishers have responded to Fifty Shades by saying, okay, we're going to do more erotica, or I'm, I'm just, I work from home, but I'm going to start my own publishing company, because you can now. Yes. Yes, and I think that, you know, one of the really, really cool things is that we're all able to realize now that we're all diverse human beings, that, you know, I my favorite books can be Pride and Prejudice and Toni Morrison's Beloved and Rachel Kramer Bussell's Dirty Girls and ELJ, you know, it can, we're diverse human beings. We're not all, like, necessarily into one, you know, pathway or one way. Yeah, I mean, like, okay, for instance, behind me there's a huge stack of books. A lot of those are cozy mysteries, which are cozies are like it's not a professional detective it's usually a woman and she maybe solves crimes in her spare time or it's a sideline they're very lighthearted they're not you know highbrow intellectual and I love them and sometimes I tell people and I think they kind of look down on me like why would you read them because like, they're fun like I read for fun yes and yes sometimes I read to learn things or I read for you know to enjoy this st sentence structure and like the beautiful writing but sometimes I just read because I want to enjoy myself I've always been a reader so why shame someone for what they want to read well Rachel let me take the uh, take the mystery off for the people who are judging your mystery <laughs> reading this weekend for the people who want to judge that this weekend I got caught up in watching a marathon on there's a Hallmark mystery channel and um, <laughs> What is the chick's name? Um, Candace Cameron has a show where she's a spinster librarian in love with a minister solving mysteries by day. And I was watching that. So there. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us who you are personally. We, we know who you are professionally. Who is the woman behind all of this work? 
That's a that's a tough question. I mean, it's funny because one of the first things I want to tell you is that I dropped out of law school because that is something I think about a lot. Like, and I I think about it less negatively now than I did back when I dropped out 15 years ago. But I think that is part of who I am. That that was a path I was on. I wanted to either do politics or law, and writing kind of found me. You know, I had never written erotica. I had only started reading it in college, and I decided I'm going to write this one story. This was towards the end of law school in 1999. That got published, and it was so amazing that it really just changed like the course of my life. But that having dropped out of law school, I would say that's a big part of what motivates me. So that just sort of I and I because I, I immediately like if someone says they have a graduate degree in my head I think oh well they're more accomplished than I am because I didn't finish law school so you know that's kind of my mindset a lot of the time but um, who I am personally I am kind of geeky about certain things I love playing bingo I love going to trivia uh, I love stuff like that um, uh, I love entering contests. Like, that's a hobby of mine. I used to have a blog about contests. Really? Um, I didn't know that. Yes. Um, and I would now if I had the time because, like, I love entering contests. And pe some people say, well, what if you don't win? Like, you're wasting your time. But no, I'm not because I love entering them. It's exciting. Awesome. So I will always stop and fill out an entry form if I'm at a store or wherever. Um, and what else? I like reality TV, and I like jigsaw puzzles. I like. I think I the, my hobbies are much more PG than like a lot of my writing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's because you put you put so much of your personal self, that other you know your your erotic self, yes. into your writing. So it makes sense. You know, I think that as human beings, we seek to find I say harmony rather than ba balance. And so you know, no, bingo in contests and you know, dirty girls and all it all evens itself out. Sometimes people think, oh well, you must be having sex every night, or you you know, your life must be so crazy. And really, I think my life, especially now, it's pretty. I mean, usually I hate this word, normal, but it's pretty average, normal, whatever you want to call it. You know, like I usually am up by six, seven, like my boyfriend leaves and goes to work and I start working at seven or eight and I'm usually at my computer, you know, not necessarily all eight, nine hours, but most of the day writing or editing or blogging and um I, I think one of the differences, aside from working for myself, is that I do take a lot of my personal experiences and turn them into writing. But it's not like I sit around and think, what is, what's happening in my life that I could write about? It's more something happens, and I feel like I can't not write about it. Like, I have to write about it. Got know? it. Got it. Okay, so I want Rachel to encourage our audience to ask questions. People push the button on the, uh, there's a Q&A icon on the video. Push that and the questions will come to us and we can find out from Rachel, you know, how she does what she does. Because yes. in addition to being a best-selling author and an editor, she also, as she said, has run successful blogs. She has the most popular cupcake blog called Cupcake Take cupcakes take the cake is that the right did I say it the right way and we'll get into that a little bit later but Rachel for now I want to know do you have a guiding principle a one mantra as I call it or affirmation uh, that you'd like to share I don't have like one single guiding principle I think you know if anything it, being flexible is the approach that I've had to take because every time I sit down and say okay like this is how this week or this month or this year is going to go. Something come, a new project comes along and changes the game. And it's you know it's not that I say yes to every project, but I I don't make a lot of concrete plans with my work life because a lot of the time the best opportunities are ones that I can't predict that either come out of the blue. I mean, not necessarily out of the blue. I mean, it's because I've been working in those fields, but. You know, so being flexible both with my time and with the the projects I'm going to work on is really, I guess, my you know, one mantra, if 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 you want to call it that. Um, and it's funny because I 
part of me wishes I could say, okay, for the next two months I'm going to do this, and then after that I'm going to do this. Like, I think it would make it would feel calmer in my head to be able to predict what's going to happen. But the truth is, every day that I work is is different. Like, you know, some I might see something in the morning that I'm like, okay, I have to write about this, and it's urgent, and so I bump what, what I was going to do to do that because. I know that if I don't do it right now, like either the timeliness will pass or just my passion for it will pass. So, and being flexible has been really good for my career because it means if I hear about an event that I want to go write about, I can, you know, change things around and go to that event and cover it, or I can take time out of my day to write an essay about something that, you know, I feel strongly about. Um, and then I do have some longer-term projects that I know, okay, by September I'll be finishing this, or by n early next year I'll be doing you know, I have some overarching things, but I, I think that's helped me both when good things happen and when negative things happen. Like some of, you know, I used to write a sex column for the Village Voice that I loved doing. I really put a lot of myself into that. It was amazing to be going home on the subway and see people reading my column. That's that was, awesome. That was a paper that I read as a teenager, yeah. and that was going along fine, and then all of a sudden, literally one day, my editor said, okay, this is your last column, and that was really hard, and it was really heartbreaking, like, who wants to hear that? Um, so, you know, but I think what I learned from that is that you just have to appreciate all the opportunities you have while you have them, and not that you expect them to end, but you can't rely on any one gig or one company, you have to be the person generating like new ideas and thinking about, okay, if this were to end, what would I do next so that you have something in place or you have ideas at least of what you would do so that when those things happen, you're not just crying in the corner. <laughs> Yeah, let's talk about that because, you know, it's easy to say don't take things personally. As a coach, I say that to people all the time. It's one of the four agreements. But when you're a writer, you know, there's nothing more personal. You know, this is your words. This is your life on paper. You know, Hemingway said writing is easy. You just sit down at a typewriter and bleed. So when you have something like a column where your identity is so wrapped up in it, how do you deal with the perception of rejection of either your editor's saying no thank you or people you know other people's opinions of it people sending you you know maybe texts you know tweets or hate tweets or whatever or how do you deal with that a lot of a lot of women have challenges around dealing with rejection in being in business for yourself I mean I definitely have I, I don't have a foolproof plan I mean there are times when I get rejected and it I, I do feel awful but one thing I do in terms of reader comments, which I welcome, I mean, I love hearing from people who are reading my stuff if it's something constructive, but I don't read comments on online articles, especially, I mean, once in a while, if it's a site, like I write a column at Dame Magazine, DameMagazine.com, and I do read their comments because usually they're constructive, and or if they're not, you know, one thing I've learned how to do is take negative comments and then I use those as a starting board of, okay, I'm going to respond to them, not to that person personally, but I'm going to say, what does it mean that when I write a column called Yes, Fat Women Are Sexy, the first thing someone says to me on this Facebook feminist group is, well, you should really be writing about the health risks of being fat. But instead of engaging that person, I did respond to them. Like, I wrote a blog post and said, you know, this is what happens when you write about fat people and you're not shaming them. Other people jump in and say, you know, aren't you concerned about the health risks? So I think you can sometimes take criticisms and rejection. And once you get over that first emotional hurdle of, okay, I feel terrible, move on from that and figure out a way to say, okay, like, you know, if you write a piece and you send it to like five publications and they all reject it, you have to, I think, think about, you know, did it get rejected because it needs work? Did it get rejected just we don't know why and try the sixth and seventh and eighth places? I think you have to try to use the rejection for some positive outcome rather than just saying, well, you know, that sucks or I suck. And I know about this from both sides because I edit a lot of anthologies and you know I'm right now I'm editing Best Women's Erotica 2016 so please help send me your stories uh, and 
I'm definitely, I've already gotten more submissions than I can use, and the deadline isn't until June 1st, so I'm going to have to send a lot of people rejections, and I hate that, like, from the other side, it's not fun to have to tell someone, sorry, I can't use this, because I know they spent time working on it, but what I try to do, or what I try to think about is the fact that maybe I can't use your story this time, but maybe I can next time, or the time after that, and that, in my career as a an editor, that's been the case lots of times where I, a story didn't work for one reason or another, but the person was a good writer and I liked their, their writing, so, you know, in a future anthology I was able to publish them. Like, so I think also having a little empathy for the person who is rejecting you, you don't know, maybe they don't have the budget or maybe they don't have the space or maybe three people sent them an article about the same topic, like, you just don't know, and some cases you'll get feedback and you might have a hint, but sometimes you're just never going to know, and that's okay, like, you have to then go back to yourself and say, okay, what is this trying to teach me, like, what can I do with this situation? I'm glad that you said that. There, I think that there are so many gems in there that uh, people can learn from in all fields that I have a coaching client who was getting really, really upset that she was submitting to, you know, that there are cer certain people, for example, the media, if you, she was trying to get publicity for her book and people, some people just wouldn't write her back and she couldn't understand it. She was like, why wouldn't they just email back and just say no thank you and, you know, she had like this very emotional reaction to something that for them is just like, oh, well, okay, I'm not interested in that, so I'm not going to reply. I think and it's human nature to have that reaction. Like, yeah. I think that's most of our first instincts, but I think you have to remember when it's business, it, it's not personal. They're not rejecting you as a person, even though if you put a lot of yourself into your work, it can feel that way. But I think, I think then you have to go back and have like a core reason for doing what you do that you believe in that you're working towards not necessarily a higher purpose but that you believe that you're doing something good in the world and then you can use that to like keep going when it feels like no one is saying yes I, and then you know I think what's happened with self-publishing for instance is that some people they're like you know what I don't want to deal with people saying no to me or I just want to fast track this so I'm going to publish it myself, but I think, like, I teach um, a lot of erotica writing classes, and a lot of the questions I get are about that, and I definitely encourage people to do it, but I think that you can't sugarcoat the fact that it's still going to be a lot of work, you know, it's not like you just do it, it goes up, and immediately it's a bestseller, I mean, either way, like, whether you publish with a publisher or you self-publish, you're still going to be doing a lot of work, in addition to the writing, like, the promoting, the... Um, marketing, there's no getting around that. So I think, unless you hire someone to do that, which is also an option, but I think that you can't, like, look at someone else's career and think, oh, well, it looks so easy when they did it, because you don't know what the behind the scenes of what they went through is. I mean, I think, so, you know, I, I'm all for self-publishing, but I think that if, like, if I were going to self-publish, I would ask people who've done it, exactly what it took and what the pros and cons were and what they wish they'd known. You know, I wouldn't just jump blindly into it because, um, you know, I think that you can save yourself some heartache on that end. Um, and then I, there's still always rejection. Some readers will like you. Some readers won't like you. Some sites may want to review your book. Some sites may not, you know. I think, I think it's, a, it's sort of a catch-22 of being an artist of any kind that I think a lot of us do bring our emotions and our raw humanness into our work and that shows but then if you, if you know you kind of have to have a thin skin to bear all that but then you have to have a thick skin to take on those rejections and it's sometimes you can't do both of those things at once like in order to bleed like you ha like with the quote you just said you have to open yourself to those criticisms for me what keeps me continuing to do that is that I do get positive feedback. Like, I do hear from people when I write something personal, and it's not always that they say, oh, I went through that myself, but maybe they went through something similar, or they know someone who did, um, or they just say, thank you for sharing that, and I think you have to focus on those people, but without pandering to them. Like, 
I think that you can't rely on other people's opinions for your own self-worth. Even though, yes, I mean, say you're a writer, you still need editors to publish your stuff or approve. I mean, you, you can't do everything yourself. Like, even if you self-publish, you still need readers to buy your book. But I think that you can't rely on your self-esteem from those outcomes because no one is ever going to approve of everything you do. Indeed. So, Rachel, this series is called Spiritpreneur School. You know, I say we're spirited entrepreneurs connect. And so I want to talk right now about the structure of your business that a lot of uh, writers or freelancers or creative people may not consider themselves to have a business, but you are in business. So I guess, first of all, do you consider yourself to be in business? And then what does that structure look like? I know you have the cupcake blog and, you know, tell us the structure of everything. Well, now um, I definitely consider what I do a business. I've been a full-time freelance writer slash editor since fall of 2011. Prior to that, I had a full-time job at a magazine. But um, And actually, I think it was late 2012, my accountant said, you need to set up a separate business for to, you know, get checks to this business. And for, for tax purposes, but, it, but by doing so, it really made me think about, okay, I run a business. So I, that's actually helped me deal with some of the stuff we were just talking about before in terms of not taking it so personally. And I've really had to branch out in the last three years outside of thinking of myself as just a writer and editor, which is not, not to say that's just anything, but to think about what else can I do. And one of the I'm pursuing um, more vigorously is teaching. So I teach in-person classes at conferences, also sex toy stores, and sometimes universities about erotica writing. Um, and I also now teach them online on a site called litreactor.com. And that's been really a wonderful outlet because what I do is so um, I'm alone most of the time. So teaching, I'm connecting with other people, even if they're online, whether they're online or in person. And, you know, it, it helps me also think about what have I learned and how can I convey that to these people. I've been writing erotica for 15 years. What, what do I want to say about how to approach it? And, you know, and sometimes they ask questions that I never considered, and I go find out the answers for them. So teaching has been really rewarding, um, both financially, that's helped me build my business, and it's just shown me, okay, I can learn a new skill, like, to recognize that teaching is its own skill, you know, just because you're a good writer doesn't necessarily make you a good teacher. So the more I do it, the more um, I think I learn about it and how to best do it. So that I've added, and I've also added consulting, where people can send me a finished piece or a draft and ask me about um, how can we you know, fix this, or is this marketable? Or they can ask me about, you know, what kind of social media presence should I have, things like that. So that's great. So, so my business is really a lot of different things. It's editing anthologies, um, blogging, cupcake blogging, which I don't do as much anymore. Freelance writing, which involves nonfiction. I mean, uh, journalism type of pieces as well as personal essays. And then I also write erotica of my own, and then I do teaching and consulting. So all of those things, you know, each bring in income. And, and I've had to really think about, like, which one do I want to pursue? How much time can I allocate to each one? And it, that changes day to day. But, um, you know, and which ones am I most passionate about? I'm actually passionate about all of them. So I like having a mix because I get – bored if I'm just doing one thing all, all day. So I like that the writing is very, you know, mainly just me sitting writing. Sometimes I'm interviewing people, so I'm interacting with people. But the teaching is very social. Editing is social in its way because, like, my new anthology is called Come Again, Sex Toy Erotica, and there's authors from six different countries in it. So, no, I don't know most of them personally. Some of them I've met. But, you know, I love that there's someone in Ireland and someone in Japan that, you know, their their stories are in my book that's now being published, I think, right now just in the U.S., but maybe it'll get translated. Like, I love connecting with those people and finding out more about them. So for this book, I did some Q&As with the authors asking them, what was the inspiration for your story? 
and the bookend.com. And that's partly just because I'm nosy. Like, I love learning about that stuff. I love finding out, like, how did you think of writing a story from the point of view of a vibrator? <laughs> That would never have occurred to me. Like I don't. I think I could sit down at my computer for a month, and I never would write a story from the point of view of a vibrator. But this person um, in Ireland did. So, you know, like I love finding out more about people, kind of like you, you know, with this yeah, series. So I love it. Yeah. So that's not necessarily part of my job description. Like I don't have to do those interviews, but I like doing it. And so I've I've really tried to find the the mix of what I'm good at, what I enjoy doing, and what will generate income and try to maximize all of those to the extent that I can. Okay, well, along those lines, Rachel, speaking of generating income, you have a question that just came in from someone named Nisha M. And if you're watching and you want to ask a question, ask it on the little question box, the blue and A Q&A, the blue and A Q&A box. <laughs> Blue and A, no, the blue Q&A box. Push that. <laughs> and Nisha wants to know, she says, your, please tell us more about your cupcake blog. Does it make money? How did you start it? I want to know more. Okay, so the blog is called Cupcakes Take the Cake. It's cupcakestakethecake.blogspot.com. Uh, the story of how I started it really is not spiritpreneur, really, because I started it... Uh, with my friend Michelle Stevens in December 2004 before Cupcakes had really gotten big, I had no idea it would someday go on to generate income and to get us on the Martha Stewart show. I had no idea. It was just a fun thing. I was doing a blog about going to comedy shows and a blog about contests and I thought, okay, Cupcakes are cool. They're fun. I'm going to start a blog about Cupcakes. So I very randomly started that with no plan, business or otherwise. And if I had, I would have bought the domain. But since I didn't, we are now still at blogspot.com. Um, and that really just started out of this interest. But it grew quickly because back then, 2005, 2006, lots of people were opening cupcake shops. I, it, it really grew organically. And then I, then I, you know, we we've at various points had other people blogging with us. And through that blog, I, I met dozens of bakers from all around the world. I visited cupcake bakeries in Dubai and London. And yes, it, it has generated different amounts of income at various points. Um, some of that is depending on like which, uh, which company we were doing the ad advertising uh, through so you know at one point I think we were making money but based on how much traffic we got or how many clicks people uh, did onto ads uh, I actually my my partner with the blog is the one who handles the money side of that and I generally do uh, the content uh, and I and I've actually eased out of I don't do as much of that anymore although I did buy a cupcake today actually and the town I now live in has like four cupcake bakeries. But um, so I think part of the reason we were successful is because we were doing it before it got really big, and we, we've been doing it now for over 10 years, so there's this longevity, so we built up a readership. And I also think some of it was luck, like cupcakes happened to get really popular, and there, there's a whole world of food blogging where there is advertising, you know, advertisers want to look to food blogs to advertise. I don't know if I started a blog about like uh, books or I started a blog about you know I don't know art or whatever. I don't know how it would be in terms of making money from that kind of blog. Um, you know I there are definitely things I wish I had thought about starting out that might what have... What would you do differently if you were starting it now? Mainly the domain name. Mainly buy the domain name, probably hire someone to design it um, and think about what I would want because some of the elements, like when we started, we decided, oh, we'll list all the cupcake bakeries that we find, we find out about. So we had like New York ones and then ones elsewhere, but that grew into over 400 listings. You know, we didn't know that it was going to be so big. You now, 400 listings on a side of a blog is, is a lot. So, but at the beginning, it was only like, say, 30. So, you know, I, I, those weren't things that we were really thinking about at the time. So I think if I was going to start a blog today, you know, I would, I would be more focused, not necessarily on the business side, but just I would have a game plan of, like, who do I want to read this? What will happen if it gets bigger? 
how will I deal with that? What do I want it to look like? But I also think there is value sometimes in not overthinking something and jumping right in, which is what I did with that one. But if it's what you want to do as your business, you know, I wouldn't, like if I were starting out writing erotica now, I wouldn't just make a blog that looks like everyone else's blog. I would, I would be a little more strategic just to differentiate myself from what other people are doing. Not that it has to be like the most glam website ever, but I would think about, okay, what am I trying to convey with this site? Um, so that's, that's one thing. That's really the only thing I think that I would do differently. Otherwise, you know, I just learned a lot by really being passionate about it and being willing to talk to people about all, all aspects of cupcake baking, the cupcake business. You know, I met people who, uh, there's a woman, Bella Cupcake Couture, and she makes cupcake wrappers, like in designs, you know, the, wow. the side of the cupcakes. So she doesn't make cupcakes herself, but she sells her products in, you know, various cupcake bakeries and directly on her website. And I, I met tons of people who have businesses related to cupcakes but that aren't strictly about making cupcakes. And I thought that was really fascinating. I think that was part a big part of your success with that blog is that it's a very specific niche. I think that rather than trying to go wide, like when you were talking about earlier with the erotica, you know, like the more niche that you can be, yes. you know, you, the deeper you can go into that niche and people are interested in, okay, the cupcake wrappers and the cupcake, the mini cupcakes. Oh, there's versus. all kinds of cupcake things. And, and, you know, we would then, once we got more popular, people would pitch us, do you want to write about this cookie or this cake or other things that were not cupcakes and we had to really say like that's a cool product or cookbook or whatever but if it's not if there's nothing about cupcakes we just can't because there's so many desserts like can you imagine if we were trying to cover every dessert like we would lose the focus and the intensity of knowing about cupcakes all over the world and so and and you know I think what was also really interesting about that process for me is that I didn't have to have everything in common with people to have to, to share cupcakes with them. Like I, I went to Hawaii on vacation and I had a cupcake meetup and all these different bakers came and made like Aloha cupcakes and all these cool cupcakes. And you know, I didn't know these people, they were strangers, but we all were passionate about cupcakes. So, and I think that's not to say that like everything you do as your business, you have to be, like personally interested in but I think the more that passion comes from somewhere inside you like the more willingness you are going to be to work more than 40 hours a week and work at night sometimes now not every night like I think if you're working from you know 6 a.m. to midnight every day that you don't really have any harmony. yeah that's not very healthy <laughs> but some days you might ha like once in a while you might have to do that and if you if it is something that's building your own business or something you genuinely are interested in I think you're gonna have an easier time of that than if you're doing something for or or even if you work for someone but if it's in the field that you want to be in I think you're gonna be more okay with doing those crazy hours um, because absolutely it's going to feel less like it's it's definitely work but it's going to feel less tedious because you feel at least like you're interested in, in what you're doing yeah and I think also for me one thing I've learned is that I I can't always say yes to everything even if it is something I really want to do sometimes I have to say I can't go to this event or I can't work on this article not because I don't want to but because I have other things that I also have to do and I just don't have the time or the energy and I would be short changing the one to do the, both of them and that's a hard thing for me especially because I do work for myself I want to keep growing and expanding my business and learning and writing for new places but I can't say always say yes and I also can't always yeah, boundaries boundaries help yeah, boundaries. I have to have boundaries with myself like sometimes I have five ideas in one day and I want to pitch all these articles and, you know, maybe I do, and, you know, maybe I get one or two articles, but I have to be careful, like, not to pitch five things at the same time. What if all those people say, yes, can you do it in three days? And then I'm, like, panicked because I, I can't do it, but I've said yes. And I've been in those situations where I've overextended myself because I was passionate, and I thought, okay, well, that passion will just 
supersede the fact that there's not enough hours in the day. Right. Well, Rachel, I want to give some actionable tips based on things that you've just spoken about. You talked about meetups, and so meetups are a part of your blogging business structure. And then you also talked about pitching articles, and someone may be watching this who wants to know how to pitch articles. So can you first tell us the role of meetups and how you do that and the role that plays in the blogs, and then also pitching articles and just what the structure is of that. It, briefly, you know, they can find out a million places online um, about that, but from you specifically, it would be so, good for them to... The Cupcake blog, um, we used to be based out of New York, and then I moved and my fellow blogger moved, so we're not doing those as much anymore, but we were doing a monthly meetup where we'd either meet at a bakery or we would do some sort of event. Sometimes we would do like a bakery hop and go to several, um, and that was a really fun way to connect with people uh, and take something that's an online activity and bring it offline. We would do pick a pit annual picnic in Central Park, and because it was in New York, you know, sometimes people would be visiting from Brazil or from wherever, and they would come. And I think that if, if especially if you do your work online, finding some way to connect offline with people, not necessarily every month, but even if it's once a year can really be valuable because people see that you're not just someone who exists on the internet, um, you're like a real person and you know they're just going to see a different side of you and you know I and, and that might not apply to every single blog or every single business but you know like I go to conferences, not a ton of them but I go to conferences in my field of erotica and sexuality and Often I am connecting with people who I know online, but you just have different kinds of conversations in person. Um, and I think that especially, like, I live on my phone, on the Internet. I'm online pretty much all the time. I'm awake. But I think there's a value also in just connecting in, in a different way, whether that's, you know, organizing a talk or going to a talk or just going to something where you're in person and you're learning in a different capacity. Um, and for and articles, for pitching articles, I would say the first thing is, you know, read the publication. Don't just think, okay, I've heard of Modern Farmer, or I've heard of, you know, I don't know, Vanity <laughs> Fair, but I've never read it, but I think my article would be good in that magazine. I mean, how will you know that unless you read the publication? So if it's a magazine, I would read three or four issues, or if it's a website, I would read it for a week or two and, you know, see what kinds of content they cover, and I would you know, like salon.com, I'll use that as an example because I've written for them. Um, you know, they tend to like articles that are 1,200 words, but say you don't know that. I would just do a copy and paste on one of their articles and see how long it is, do it that on a couple of them and say, okay, usually if their articles are this many words long, then I have a, a ballpark figure of how long my article should be, you know, because you don't want to pitch them and say, I want to write a 5,000 word article when they don't publish 5,000 word articles. So I think just paying attention to the kinds of topics they cover. Um, now you can also follow like, at Salon on Twitter, but you can also look up uh, who's who the editor is, either in their masthead, and like sort of see what topics they write about. Sometimes editors will put out a call on social media. They're looking for um, new pieces. Uh, I would try to find if they have formal guidelines to follow find those. Um, you Sometimes, you know, this is hit or miss, but if, if you can't find those, I would ask someone who's written for those publications, do you have a contact you could share, um, or, you know, do you know where their guidelines are? Um, and also just, you know, pay attention. I wrote a piece for time.com that I just sent in because they had ideas at time.com listed at the end of their articles, and it said, we write, we cover these topics you know, send us your pieces. So, you know, not all publications have their guidelines posted, but many of them do. And I would say if there are guidelines, follow them. Every single time I put out a call for submissions for an anthology, someone sends me something, like if it says maximum 2,000 words, they send me 4,000 words. And that's like a waste of their time and my time. So read the guidelines and follow them to the best of your ability. And be confident. Like, don't say, 
I don't really know what I'm doing, or I've never done this before, or you probably won't won't take this, but I thought I'd give it a try. Like, you don't have to go the opposite direction and say, this is the best article you'll ever read. I mean, don't do that either, but just say, like, I'm a writer. Even if you've never published anything before, you're still a writer. So you can say, you know, I'm a freelance writer, and here's my submission. Thank you for considering it. I mean, just, I think, short and simple and confident without being cocky. But I, I do tend to see, whether it's online postings or sometimes I've seen submissions, you know, people just, I think that they're nervous, and it's okay to be nervous, but don't tell the editor. Or, right. Don't, there's no need to tell the editor. I think that's often, often women do that, um, where they sort of, I've seen it where people are sharing a link to something they wrote, and they, they write, you know, I never thought this place would take my article, but they did. I don't think you have to say that, because I think, I mean, you don't have to say, I was sure this place would take my article. You don't have to lie, but I think being confident, you know, that showcases who you are to the world whether it's to you're emailing one person or you're posting it on online, I think that I often see this undercurrent of the opposite of self confidence, like, you know, uncertainty. Self deprecating. Self -deprecating. Yeah. And I think that just doesn't make you look as professional as it could. So I think in your communications with editors, but also, you know, if you have a blog, um, you know, be as confident as you can. I mean, while being honest. I mean, the other side of that is that I think people appreciate vulnerability and honesty, you know, and risk-taking. And, you know, if you really were a nervous wreck, like, I think that's okay to say that in a blog post, but I just think overall think about what message you're sending with right. all your communication. I mean, you don't have to overthink every tweet, but, you know, I think sort of think about what are people going to, take from that? What what am I projecting into the world? And if you don't know, like if you're like, I can't analyze myself like that, ask your friends, like, what do you think about my or own? Or hire Rachel to be your you know? consultant and she will let you know. So wait, Rachel, I'm going to jump in just because we're running out of time and we have so much to yeah. cover and want to learn from you. Um, one of the things that you said in terms of, you said, you know, being vulnerable and in your writing you are pretty naked and it's really, really powerful that recently, um, well actually over the past while you've been writing about hoarding and so I want to talk about hoarding and mental health and self-care um, and just, just all of it. So let's talk. Well, I've always found writing to be very cathartic whether it's about something personal. Um, when I was, I think, in college, I wrote a piece for Parade, you know, that's in the Sunday newspaper about my dad being an alcoholic, and that was probably the first time I wrote something very vulnerable and revealing, and it was about both myself and someone else. Um, and that was really hard. They ran it with my photo. It said something like, my father is an alcoholic, and this is back before, you know, email was super prevalent. So I got handwritten letters, many from also teenagers and kids. And to me, that was proof that even though some people in my family thought, okay, that's revealing too much, I knew that I had my own reasons for that. So, and, and I don't think it's for everyone. That's not to say that everyone should be like burying their family secrets or, you know, their shameful things in public. But if you if you feel like you have something to express, for me, I think about, okay, why am I writing this? It's, is it just to be an exhibitionist? Is it just to say, okay, I've done this thing, or is there a broader message? And I think really personal writing can have a broader message, even if you're not explicitly saying, like, this is how I overcame being a hoarder, just admitting whatever it is that you feel um, awkward about or you've felt shame about, to me, releasing that into the world has, I would say almost always, like 99% has been a positive experience because it made it a little bit less secretive and it made me feel a little bit better about it, um, partly because I heard from people who also have experienced that and partly because it just took it a little bit away from me and in my own head and brought it somewhere else. And it also forced me to think about, like, why am why do I hoard? Like some people deal are hoarders because you know of a traumatic childhood event. That's not the case with me. So so it I think the process of writing has 
made me answer some deep questions that I don't always just ask myself in the random course of my day. Like I'm not sitting eating breakfast asking myself, why are you a hoarder? But if I sit down to write an essay, and then especially if I get feedback from an editor, they'll say like, okay, can you unpack this a little bit? Like what does this mean? Um, so, and I think readers really appreciate that vulnerability. Um, but it's tough. It's a tough balancing act. It's like what we were saying before. Like if you are giving so much of yourself personally and emotionally, I think you have to figure out what the boundaries are. You know, it's not like every stranger I meet I want to talk about hoarding with. Um, and I and I don't. It's not like I go to a party and say, if people say, what do you do? And I say, I'm a writer. And they say, what do you write about? I'm not like, oh, I write about being a hoarder because I don't know what their reaction is going to be. I don't even always say I write erotica. Sometimes I just say something much more general, like I write about pop culture because I don't always want to have that conversation. And I think recognizing your own boundaries in terms of what you write about uh, in terms of the people in your life and in terms of how that plays out. Like maybe you're writing really personal stuff but you call it fiction and you change some things around. That's okay too. And that fiction can be even more personal and intense and raw as nonfiction. Mm -hmm. It's just a different format. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, I just want to, I, I, we spoke about it a little bit before we, we came on camera, and I just want to just say again, I thank you for that writing. I thank you for that, that, you know, it's, that for me, I think it's really important that we talk about, you know, shame and, you know, all of these things that we don't feel comfortable with sometimes as women, you know, depression and anger and, you know, these kind of unwelcome topics and when someone is able to bear themselves or bear their soul or just say, you know, this happened to me, like the, you know, the old Jane uh, column, you know, and sassy column for the people of our generation, you know, this happened to me. There's such power just in those words and it gives people permission to, to be themselves and say, oh, wow, okay, you know, I'm, I'm human like everyone else. I think they're, it's very powerful. So I think they, also sometimes people feel like if they're writing an essay or whatever, they have to have all the answers. You don't have to have all the answers. You can say, I'm still dealing with this, or I'm still struggling with this, or this is how I've tried to work on this, this worked, this didn't, you know, I'm going to try this next. Like, you don't have to wrap it up always with a happy ending, you know, because life isn't always perfect like that. So I think part of that vulnerability can be admitting that, like, what you don't know. But I think sometimes people think they can only write about the things they know inside and out, like, that they're, they're experts in. But I think, you know, life is messier than that. So I, you know, asking questions and um, of yourself and maybe asking questions of readers through the course of whatever you're writing can be a way to, at least for me, that's how I process a lot of things, especially personal things. That's just how I think I'm built. Like, that's how I do it. Some people journal or some people do art or some people do sports, but that's how I do it with writing. Me too. So has procrastination or writer's block ever been something that you've had to contend with? All of the time. I, I'm... I usually deal with it by then, like, starting another project. Like, if I'm stuck on one essay, I'll either do something totally different, like I'll go from nonfiction to fiction because I just have to let it sit, or I'll just do something that's different, like administrative. Um, I, I have writer's block all the time, and sometimes I make notes or make a list. Like I, I try to write around the topic but without full sentences. Like I'm like, okay, I'm not in the headspace to write the formal essay, but like what points do I want to make when I when I am writing the essay? And then I go backwards like later and flesh out each of those points. Um, and sometimes I do it kind of mathematically. Like I say, all right, I want 1,200 words. I need 100 words 12 times. You know, I break it down very minutely so that I... I don't have to sit down and feel pressure of writing 1,200 words. I'm just writing 100 words. Um, sometimes, because I do multiple, you know, teach and edit, you know, sometimes when I don't feel like writing, like right now I'm editing this anthology, Best Women's Erotica, I will go, you know, maybe read some submissions for that and work on that because that's accessing a different part of my brain than writing about, you know, hoarding or whatever it is. 
Mm, I think that those will be very helpful tips uh, for a lot of people. Good advice there, Rachel. Thank yeah. you. What is your North Star? What guides you when things get tough or challenging or scary or all of those things? Um, I, I, I try to um, think about, like, I can be very... Um, sort of poo-poo my past accomplishments, like, oh, I did that thing that at the time was such a big deal. So one yeah, like you mentioned, I totally forgot because it's not in your bio that you were on Martha, the Martha Stewart show, and when you said I was like, oh, yeah, I remember so seeing her. There is, like, one moment that I think about because in 2003, I had a job that I hated. Like, I was not even an admin assistant, but I was a typist, and the people at where I worked, they weren't horrible, but it just was not a pleasant place to work. And I got asked to um, submit an application for a job at Penthouse Variations, which I wound up getting that job. But before I got the job, after I had applied, I remember I had a copy of it and we crossed out the name of the person who was leaving and like I wrote in my name. And that like felt so powerful to like see my name there. And then, you know, later on when I got the job, like my name was on the NAS. But I remember like crossing it out and that felt so good. And like to me, you know, I had that job for seven years, and that ended in 2011. To 2011, so it feels like such a long time ago. I mean, I started it in 2004, but I think back to like being at that job I hated and feeling like, how am I ever going to get out of this? And like, I didn't know exactly how I would get out of it. I didn't have a exact plan of this is the path I will take. But you know, I when that happened I, I did that and so like that's sometimes I actually visualize my byline in the places I want to write for um, I mean I don't like sit there and cross it out in a magazine but like I visualize it um, and maybe it's hokey and you know it doesn't it's not no, like it works you know, but I'm all like, about visualizing and I think if I don't do that like sometimes I just talk myself out of even like submitting like I mean I've literally flipped through magazines and been like oh well that person must be a better writer than I am because they're writing for that place, and like that's not true, you know. And, and it's like just because it didn't happen today or even next year doesn't mean it won't happen, you know, the next year. I think like, I mean, yes, we can all get discouraged at times, but I think you have to think, okay, if I really want that, how can I go after that? Um, yeah. What can I do in the meantime? Rachel, do you care or anything? Thing like that? I, I don't. I've thought about doing a vision board. Um, the, the closest, a vision board that you just did, the crossing out and the, the name. Closest that's I've come, I have a whiteboard that I am trying to be better about using, partly just like so I can keep track of multiple projects because sometimes I take on like a lot of things and you know one thing's due next week and five things are due in three weeks and I think I'll remember them all and I don't. So I'm trying to get better about putting up visual reminders because I think those will help me stay on track rather than, like, I'm the kind of person, like, I'll sit here and have a deadline that's due tomorrow, but I want to think about what I'm going to work on next week. So sometimes I need those things to just say, okay, this is what's happening today. I'm actually about to get a, a whiteboard calendar so I can write in what's Ooh, that's what's good. On each day. My friend has one, and I'm like, I think I need that. I need to look up and see it rather than just have it in my head or a random to-do list. Well, I have two questions for you left. Um, my last book is named The Sacred Bombshell of Self-Love. And so how did you learn how to love yourself? Um, well, I think it's really an ongoing process. You know, like I said earlier, uh, you know, there's a part of me that I kind of can go to when I'm having a bad day where I'm like, oh, well, you're just this law school dropout, even though I am proud of all the stuff I've done. So... I think I have to, like, sometimes I literally, and this feels narcissistic to say it, but I will look at my bookshelf and be like, okay, I'm a law school dropout, but I've also edited all these books. So yeah. again, having that visual reminder in front of me, like, really does help because it's like, sometimes I, it's not that I forget, but it's one thing to say, okay, edited 50 anthologies, but to see them right there and think, oh, yeah, I remember that one and that one and that one. Because I That's think when you're living in the... In the moment, you forget about, like, all the other things you did before. Do you have them all on one shelf? No, I don't have them all on one shelf. But that's my – I want to. I used to, and then I moved, and they're sort of in various places. Okay. I think you've got to get them back all on one I do. I do. You're right. That's 
amazing. Yes, I will, that I will amazing. do that and post a photo. <laughs> yes, okay, good, good. So I define a sacred bombshell, Rachel, as a woman who loves, honors, and cherishes herself, mind, body, and spirit. What makes you a bombshell, Rachel? I think um, I, 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 this is like I don't know why that's like I feel like oh my god I don't I don't even know um I think like getting past those voices that have told me okay you can't do this and just you know trying things and seeing what happens and that's how, really how a lot of my career has come about like that village voice column I didn't you know that kind of came to me but so being open to new opportunities but also trying to position myself to be ready for those opportunities um. I think that, like, more than having, like I said, like, I don't have a set plan. I don't have a five-year plan. I don't have a vision board. I don't even know exactly, like, my one-year plan. But I think that's actually my strength, you know, in terms of just being open to what will happen and trusting myself to be able to figure that out when the time comes. Beautiful. Well, I love this conversation. This was awesome. <laughs> Please tell people, Rachel, not only like where they can find you, what your tell them what your current projects are, and also uh, you mentioned that you were a call for submissions earlier. So tell people how to submit. And okay. Well, you can. Uh, my website is rachelkramerbustle.com. I'm on Twitter at Raquelita, R A Q U E L I T A. Best Women's Erotica is open to all women authors, and you can find the guidelines at Best Women's Erotica 2016.tumblr.com. They're also on my website. Uh, right now I'm promoting Come Again, Sex Toy Erotica, which just came out a couple weeks ago. And uh, I'll be doing a couple of events for that. And I am teaching a new erotica workshop online at litreactor.com, L-I-T-R-E-A-C-T-O-R.com, um, May 5th to June 2nd. So you can go to their website and get more information. And uh, I don't know. Well, um, sort of working on various things after that. Yay! Well, that is all very awesome. Get your submissions in to Rachel. Go see her and buy her new book and any one of her 50-plus uh, books and everything that she's got going on. Oh, and you can also go to comeagainbook.com for information about Come Again. Okay, all right. And your, did you give your main site? You did, right? Muscle.com, my full name.com, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for this conversation, Rachel. I adore you, oh, and I appreciate you. you taking this time with us today. And for you who are watching, Rachel Kramer Bustle is proof that you can be whatever you were born to be, that you can answer your calling, and if she can do it, you can do it. So thank you, Rachel, and to everyone watching, namaste. The sacred bombshell in me sees, adores, and accepts the sacred bombshell in you. Bye.